Endo Community Conversations, a series of Q&A with endo experts and advocates hosted by the Endometriosis Foundation of America in partnership with my endometriosis team. I'm Diana Felzone, an endo found ambassador and executive producer of Endo TV and a patient advocate. Today, our conversation will focus on pain management and endometriosis. I am so excited to be joined today by Dr. Dan Martin, Endo found scientific and medical director to discuss this very important topic that can help navigate this really hard disease. And I can say that because I live with it daily as well. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Martin, for joining us. Thank you, Diana. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Definitely. It's wonderful to have you with us. And you have such a background in this disease. You have lived it, breathed it for so many years. Can you tell us a little bit about your background in medicine? As you noted, I'm Endofound's scientific and medical director. In addition, I'm a retired physician and professor emeritus at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. I've studied endometriosis since 1970 and began publishing research on it in 1983. And what what made it for you a passion? Why did you say, I have to get into this field, especially at the time where endometriosis, it's starting to get um, more and more awareness and, and word recognition in the vernacular of, of mainstream society. But in the 70s, the 80s, it certainly wasn't something that people talked about. So what brought you into this field? I think one of the answers to that, for those of you who've been to Endofound's videos files, go to Endofound's video files and put in Whoopi Goldberg. So listen to Whoopi Goldberg's talk from about 10 or 11 years ago, because she was seen by her physician shortly after I was being trained. Mm -hmm. And whoever she saw was similar to the people who trained me. They took endometriosis seriously and believed that it was an important event. Later, I was trained in reproductive endocrinology and infertility. And in the 70s, endometriosis was seen more was seen more as a disease for infertility than it was for pain. Mm -hmm. In spite of the fact that it was just as important for pain then as it is now, it was more for fertility than it was pain. And that's to some degree because fertility was seen as a disease, while pain was seen as being a normal part of being a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, in the process of all of this, my background in physics has to do with masers, which are preliminary to lasers. And I was doing laser research and we found that using laser concepts in addition to excisional concepts could be combined together to produce good surgical research. So a lot of my early publications were about surgical research using lasers for excision. Dr. Martin, there are theories about endometriosis, how it, how it starts, what it stems from. Can you discuss some of those theories with us? There, there are multiple theories. Uh, I, I have a file online. If somebody goes to my website at danmartinmd.com, you can find it. But it has 19 different theories and concepts that I, I discuss. It takes about four to really begin the discussion just for the cell of origin because the cell of origin can come from anything from retrograde menstruation to congenital rest, peritoneal metaplasia, disseminated bone marrow stem cells, and then it progresses to why all of those happen. Those are then activated by estrogen, inflammation or other causes, and transform into endometriotic cells that may have aromatase production or progesterone resistance. Those are associated with inflammation that can be surrounded by scarring and fibrosis, and these can cause pain because the endometriosis itself can, can, can produce prostaglandins that cause contractions and, and uh, cramping. And there's inflammation or scarring. The inflammation can be painful itself or the scarring can trap blood and nerves. So that's the origin of pain. Is That's the reasoning behind it. That's yeah. why it causes, causes such severe debilitating cramping, as you said, there's also something that I've experienced has been um, pulling pain, where it will feel like something is stuck and pulling. 
Uh, are those adhesions or are the scar tissue that you just referenced that endo can cause? Arnold, Arnold, Arnold Kresh would tell you that pulling pain is more commonly adhesions and scarring from previous surgery. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, as, as, as I know, you've had more surgery than anybody ever wants to have. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's true. But I, I recall even before I had my first excision surgery, I did have, I felt like something was stuck and I felt like something was like pulling down. Um, and sciatic leg pain also is a commonality uh, for people that suffer from endometriosis and some of the, um, some of the symptoms that they have. Um, we do have a series of questions, but before we get to any of it, one of the, the keynotes, um, actually what you covered over the patient conference this weekend, you discussed peritoneal endometriosis. What exactly is peritoneal endometriosis for those that were unable to watch your speech? The peritoneum is the inside lining of the abdomen. And peritoneal endometriosis is when the endometriosis is either on the surface or it's limited to that area. Almost most endometriosis in the body involves the peritoneum, but it goes deeper than that. So the other forms, in addition to surface peritoneum and infiltrating early peritoneum, there's a deep infiltrating portion. Uh, there's adenoma types that can hide behind the peritoneum. There's ovarian cystic endometriomas. Uh, moreover, Peritoneal endometriosis has multiple appearances in the literature. In the, in the literature, there are more than 60 overlapping phenotypes that vary by age. Uh, I'd like to use some examples of the age changes so you get an idea of what I'm talking about. For those of you who don't want to see the lesion appearances, close your eyes for about 40 seconds until you hear Diana again. <laughs> but if we look at those appearances, we can see in teenagers, that these start off very small, less than a millimeter. So a millimeter, these are these are all these sizes in this one are around a hundredth of an inch. Now at this size, these real small, clear looking lesions look like a lot of other diseases because when they're very small, a lot of things look the same. So those could be endometriosis, somoma bodies, endosalpingiosis, nonspecific inclusions, inflammatory changes. But as they age, they grow, they trap old blood, and then they look like these dark scarred lesions. And these things are called powder burns. And the dark part of that is trapped old blood. So that's old blood that's been bleeding into these and trapped inside the scar tissue. And the distension of that scar tissue can cause pain. In addition to that dark scarred lesion on this slide, there are three satellites. There's a clear scarred one up at the top of the secular one on the left and another dark scarred one at the bottom. Moreover, those are specific appearances that can be endometriosis or other diseases. In addition to specific appearances, we worry about nonspecific things. On this slide, there are several other areas where the peritoneum does not look normal. Anytime the peritoneum does not look normal in a patient with endometriosis, there's about a 25% chance that endometriosis is hiding there. So as patients age, these, these changes occur and we have to be ready for the different appearances. And that's one of those things that makes research so difficult. Speaking of the appearances changing, you just showed someone in their teens to then later years. Is this why early intervention and um, not necessarily intervention, but at least the diagnosis of endometriosis early on can be so beneficial for someone that suffers from it? Well, there are two ways of looking at that. One is you want to have early intervention to stop those from progressing. And the other one is, remember, we talked about no matter what theory you believe, estrogen stimulation, inflammatory stimulation, and activation are needed to keep these growing. If we can stop that inflammation or stop that estrogen stimulation early enough, we may stop these from growing altogether. So sometimes a diagnosis is not in your best interest. If you can control those by stopping the estrogen and stopping the inflammation and keep them quiet, then, then remember, we have more patients who have asymptomatic endometriosis that's stable and not doing anything than we do who have either pain or infertility. Mm -hmm. So all three of those groups are about the same, but there's slightly more who have inactive endometriosis. And those are ones where the body's immune systems are taking care of them. 
If we control the inflammation, the estrogen stimulation, we might convert more of those, those symptomatic patients into an asymptomatic state and avoid surgery altogether. Uh, I'd much rather avoid surgery than have surgery if we can do that. Now, if you do, if we do avoid the surgery, then they still need to have ongoing examinations to make sure nothing changes. Is there any way to treat peritoneal endometriosis versus other forms of endo? Yes. Uh, if we could be sure that it was one of those first slides I showed you on the on the teenage ones, that's easy to see that that's superficial on, on the surface of the peritoneum. Mm -hmm. Almost any technique we use to treat those, whether it's coagulation. Uh, uh, vaporization, ablation, excision, they all work because the lesions are so small. But that second lesion I showed you, the larger one, it's difficult to tell just by looking at it how deep that goes. Mm -hmm. If that goes past two millimeters, you will not be able to, to coagulate the entire area. So ablation doesn't work when that one is deep. Uh, so for very superficial ones, almost anything works. As it goes deeper, the only thing that works is excision. And for a lot of lesions, the only way to be sure that it's not deep is to excise it. Uh, although some of the simpler techniques are efficient for uh, peritoneal endometriosis, potentially those little pebbles that were on the surface, they're not very effective for deeper endometriosis. We have some questions for the uh, from the My Endo team from Angel. And Angel wants to know what are some tips from, um, excuse me, what are some tips to manage joint pain resulting from, from treatments for endometriosis? I'm going to have to make one assumption in answering that is my guess is she was on some medication that stopped her estrogens because that's the ones that we, that we occasionally saw. Uh, so joint pain associated with, with medications used to treat endometriosis can be due to decreasing the estrogens that's needed for bone health. So the estrogen not only stimulates endometriosis, but it also keeps bones healthy. So it's, you can't, it's hard to fight both at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll come back to how you treat that in a second. But the other thing is it may also be related to endometriosis association with rheumatoid arthritis, body posture imbalance, multiple sources of pain over, uh, overloading the system. Mm -hmm. So treating the pain with medications such as non anti-inflammatory medication, diet, exercise, and general, general pain management might be useful. If it is medication related, then stopping the medication can be useful. And I had about three patients who had significant knee joint, joint pain related to a GnRH agonist and it took some of those for up to six months for the pain to go away, even after stopping the medication. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and it, it kind of, the thing about endometriosis too, is it's an inflammatory disease. So that can play into joint pain as well. Um, swelling, all which kind of is this storm for all of these other um, comorbidities, like you mentioned RA, uh, to, to potentially appear for someone who is an endo sufferer. Yes, that's true. That's, that's, that's very important. Inflammation is a major part of everything that goes on in endometriosis. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, um, of turmeric, everything turmeric. <laughs> I don't know if it actually works, but, you know, whatever, whatever you can try to do. Um, we have another question from my endo team member who asked, I've heard that managing your diet and exercising can help manage endometriosis. You just mentioned this, Dr. Martin, about ways that this could possibly help. And I mentioned turmeric. Um, how can diet and exercise reduce the pain from endometriosis? I'm going to change that. I'm going to change that question a little bit because how questions are always difficult to answer. We A lot of things about how we're guessing. I'm going to kind of give you some ideas about why they might work but the exact reason of how is difficult to determine. Diet may change general body inflammation. It can increase the, 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 the change the biome in the body. It can change reactions to things like gluten, dairy products, refined sugars. Uh, so any diet that, that controls all of those may have to do with sugars and other things that cause body inflammation that is in, in is increasing the amount of inflammation in the joints. Uh, one of the reasons I retired is because I've got real bad joint pain in my hips. And I just really figured that was gonna be something I was gonna have my entire life. 
after I retired and had time to go to see physical therapy, what they focused on was balances that re the exercises that rebalance the alignment of my, my ligaments and muscles, stretch them different ways, pull them into a different position. And that made every difference in the world. I mean, I still have a little discomfort in that area, but nothing that would be caused pain. And I used to have just pain that would almost stop me in surgery. Mm -hmm. So physical therapy, and those exercises that work on your joints and your and how the muscles and ligaments work together uh, works well. Mm -hmm. uh, exercise may have something to do with the same thing. I don't exactly understand at all why exercise works, but I know that I feel better if I exercise. And that may be just a general ability to balance your overall body sensation and, and balance your energy levels. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who are looking for other suggestions, I'd, I'd suggest that you Google uh, joint pain and endometriosis or Google diet and endometriosis. There are a lot of interesting ideas on, on Google that don't cost anything. You don't have to see a doctor to do them mm -hmm. and may be very useful to you. Yeah, I mean, I know for me that I love processed food. Like I could eat a plate of processed meats and cheeses and be very happy, but my body does not like them. Um, I notice that it causes me to swell and to have inflammation and it's just not, it's just not copacetic. Um, so I feel as though once you kind of learn your trigger foods with endo, you know, to avoid them and you know, when you're willing to take the little bit of indulgence because you're like, well, I know it's going to happen. Am I willing to risk it or not? Um, I also feel like uh, for, for me as well, um, stretching Pilates, I'm too, too, um, I'm too unfocused and able to do a yoga, but, but those kinds of things do help when I'm in pain to, to just try to get a semblance of kind of slowing down and stretching out because as anyone with endo knows, once the pain takes hold of you, it takes hold of you. And it is really difficult to get a handle on that. Um, and unfortunately there is no common, there is no easy, there's no cure. There's no easy treatment. It's, it's, it's almost like, um, it's trial and error for the individual to figure out what can help them get through. I mean, I call it, I wouldn't even call it an episode because it, it happens. It's common when you have this disease, maybe more for others, but um, I know when it just happens to me, I'm always surprised. I forget that it's a chronic illness and I'm like, wait a minute. Hey, wait, this wasn't supposed to happen. I was good for two months and then it happens again. And you just try to, to use your typical combination of whether that's like your heating pad, your stretching, your ibuprofen, whatever it might be. Um, some, of, some of that, and some of that has to do with the concept of central sensitization. And that is if you're in pain long enough, your mind gets used to being in pain and hmm. it will remember it. And even when there is not a source of pain, your mind will still interpret it as though there is pain there. Uh, as a, an example, that's not exactly the same thing, but it's close, is a phantom limb pain. Mm -hmm. After somebody's had a, had a limb amputated, they can still feel pain. So, so have a leg amputated, let's not say limb, a, a, a leg amputated. They can still feel pain in a leg that's not even there. So the, the mind has an amazing ability to make things seem to be there that aren't there. And also and correct me if I'm wrong with endometriosis as well, it does, it, it can affect how you hold yourself, how you're posturing, how you can kind of clench with pain. And there's a lot that can go into to the musculoskeletal system um, that can, can kind of add to ongoing things that might be happening internally with the system. Um, some people told me when, after I had an excision surgery that, they suggested I did PT um, because the PT would help my body release some of the areas it was holding so tight in order to compensate for living with daily chronic pain for so long and try to get, you know, get back to a healthier way of, of kind of just moving my body without having these lesions and adhesions that were there prior. And, and for those of you who've never been to a physical therapist, 
if for the first three or four weeks you believe that they're trying to destroy your body, <laughs> you think that they don't know what they're doing, remember, these people have a pretty good idea of what they're doing. It took them about three or four weeks to get me to the point that anything worked. Mm -hmm. uh, and after that, it was just a brand new thing. I'm so, I, I, uh, I right now, we, I have one who actually hires a, as a uh, exercise trainer just to, just to be around all the time because insurance won't pay for physical therapy forever, but, but, and, and they can't, and they, and since I'm on Medicaid, Medicaid or Medicare, or Medicaid, whichever one you're only on, you're my age now, uh, they can't function as physical therapists. We have them, we have them function as, as, uh, exercise trainers and they stay away. They're just, they're pretty good about staying away from specific, uh, extra physical therapy, but they do give you a bunch of exercises that can do very similar things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I found this really useful to stay with them and keep, keep all this in, under control. But remember, in the beginning, you may think that they don't know what they're talking about. For people who might not have access to physical therapists and doctors such as yourself, um, surgeons, excision specialists, if they're in gripping pain and they're watching this and they feel like they're in a dark tunnel with no hope of getting out of that kind of distressed state, what can they do at home to help alleviate? Because I've been in that dark tunnel and it is scary. It is lonely and you feel like there's, you know, you don't know when your body's going to release you from it. What can someone possibly do at home if they're at a 10 plus, you know, level pain? And obviously pain is subjective, but 10 plus level pain, but not yielding necessarily to you know, they can't go to the hospital or what have you. I'm not saying a medical crisis happening, but just really bad pain. It's a really good question. Uh, it, re it requires more knowledge than I have right now to try and guess what, the, what would work in any specific circumstance. Mm -hmm. But since that can happen to anyone with endometriosis, it would be good to at least find out what other resources you have if you have access to the web, I would Google any kind of just pain relaxation therapies. There are a lot of self-help things that are on the web, self-help books. Uh, use any of those because some of them, all of them worked for somebody, for someone, otherwise they wouldn't have been written. And some of them may work for you. When, and I, I touched upon this because we did say pain is subjective, but when is pain telling you that you need to seek medical attention ASAP? Oh, with if, if, it, if it's if it's interfering with daily activities, if it's stopping, if it's interfering with work, if it's interfering with school, if it causes you to miss any of those, then it's obvious that's not normal pain. Mm -hmm. Pain pain's not supposed to interfere with daily activities. Uh, it, it's hard it's hard to to determine how much less pain than that is worth seeing a physician about. But for sure, if it's interfering with your activities, school, your ability to enjoy life, uh, your function, I'd see someone about it. Mm -hmm. I had a friend who confided in me, she has endometriosis, and she said to me, you know, I'm at ER level pain. And I said, what do you mean ER level pain? And she said, well, you know, I have a coding system for myself now that when I have a, you know, really bad, she called it a flare, a flare with endometriosis. She's like, I usually have my, my to go, you know, kit in my way of, of whatever her pain management um, was for herself. She said, but when I get to ER level pain, it is the symptoms of, I get a low grade temperature. I am vomiting and I'm in more pain than I can tolerate. That's when I go to the ER. Um, as a physician, is there any signs in which if someone with endo is having, you know, X, Y, and Z, they should go to the hospital? If, boy, that would be one of those things where somebody, I'd, I'd have to hear the exact symptoms from mm -hmm. a patient. That was always a very hard distinction to make, even when listening to somebody. Yeah. Well, so I don't have any. I don't have any specific guidelines. Uh, so I, I don't. I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah. No, it's probably more patient to patient, but 
think in general, if you feel like something's wrong and you're scared, you probably should seek medical intervention at that point. Um, Dr. Martin, being that you have committed yourself to, to this disease and to educating people about it, is there any takeaways that, that you could give people that are watching tonight um, that could you know, relate it to pain management and endometriosis? Just, I'd, I'd, re, I'd re-emphasize some of what we said before. Pillar cramps are not normal. Uh, not only are they painful, they interfere with body function and stress-related changes that can include inflammation, neuroimmune modulation, body uh, dysfunction. And treating those with anti-inflammatory agents and hormonal suppression and other medication can help to tro- control the pain can decrease the activation and stimulation of endometriosis, decrease the chance you're gonna get central sensitization. And if you can stop all of that, it may allow the body's immune system to stabilize or eradicate endometriosis. With early stages, that might stop it altogether. And with late stages, it might at least keep you from either going to surgery or or make it possible that you get a better result from surgery. Well, thank you so much for your time tonight and for sharing the wisdom that you've collected um, over over decades now. Um, it's really it's really quite something. And even with all this information, I will say, do you still find endometriosis to be one of the more perplexing illnesses that that are you know with us to to date? Oh, it's it's obviously an enigmatic disease. I think that Donna Vogel had the uh, best comment in about 1999, and that was studying endometriosis is like nailing jello to a tree. <laughs> it just, it's just almost impossible to get a good fix on exactly what it is and exactly what we should do. Looking back at the beginning of your career and now today, do you think that we have made tremendous strides towards a cure for endometriosis? Are we getting closer? We, we know a lot more than we knew 40 years ago. Um, what I want is, is some way to stop it from occurring. Hmm. And I hope that we can develop techniques that will stop it in its tracks by treating it early. Unfortunately, some people with endometriosis have no symptoms and no findings at all until We've, I've got one patient who, who tells me that when she was a teenager, her periods would start without without her even knowing that they were there so that she was mm-hmm. always prepared for her periods to start because they just come out of nowhere, no symptoms at all. And the first time she knows she has endometriosis is, is when she can't get pregnant mm-hmm. and has significant endometriosis. So for those who have pain and at least some symptoms, we've got a chance that we can treat them proactively and follow them proactively and decrease the chance that they're going to have debilitating disease and need repeat surgeries. Yeah. Well, thank you for your devotion to endo and to trying to to make it better for those that live with this disease. And for those that are listening and you have a question you want it answered in an upcoming Q&A, leave us a comment on Facebook or Instagram. And if you're interested in continuing the conversation with others in the endo community, you can join our team on My Endometriosis Team, the official online community of the Endometriosis Foundation. And don't forget to tune in this time next week for our following Q&A. And again, thank you for joining us today and we'll see you soon.